Hello, my fellow forgiven sinners. Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We are continuing through our summer series on what it means to follow Jesus. And to that end, uh, we are going to study the book of Philippians, or sorry, Ephesians, rather. Uh, a le- that's a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the first century Christians in the city of Ephesus. Uh, this letter is a, is a really good explanation uh, of God's purpose in the world today and how we can aim our lives at that same purpose as well. Uh, And so this week, uh, again, as we are uh, dwelling on this idea of following Christ, uh, we're going to see that following Christ also means talking about Christ. And so to that end, uh, let's look at the very beginning of this letter to the Ephesians and to discuss uh, the many reasons that we Christians have for talking about and praising our awesome God. We naturally share good news with each other, right? Uh, Whether it's a a great purchase we've made or something cool that happened to us or or just some exciting new thing that we learned about, right? We love to share good news. So our goal today is to equip you with a lot of good news uh, that you can easily and readily share with others. So let's uh, read through Ephesians chapter 1. We'll do verses 3 through uh, 14 today. Normally I read the whole thing at the start here, but today we're going to break things up a little bit uh, just because there's a lot for us to get through today. Uh, In verse 3, we read uh, Paul writing, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. This is how Paul starts his letter to the Ephesians. By praising God. This is what uh, this is what I mentioned before, right? Uh, we naturally just talk about good news, things that we are excited about. Paul is excited about Jesus, and he wants you and me to be excited about it too. This really sums up uh, all of Ephesians, actually, and all of our Christianity. You see, uh, Paul is pointing us right now to a first commandment reality. As Christians, uh, we are to have no other gods before the one true God revealed in the scripture. Uh, Luther explains uh, that this means that we fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Today, we can think of that same commandment in terms of what gets my highest praise in life. Think uh, for a moment about your favorite topics of conversation. Uh, What are those things that you naturally talk or think about the most? Those things are likely some of the most important things to you, yeah? Uh, Many people uh, love to talk about their family, and that is great. But that can, family can quickly become an idol, something that I love more than God. Uh, Many people love to complain about our immoral society, often because they value morality. They value good living, right? Uh, However, that praise of morality can quickly become self-righteousness, the same sin that made the Pharisees hate Jesus so much. And here's a big question for us uh, in this regard. Uh, Think about uh, what you often talk about. And if you and I are never talking about Jesus, what does that say about how important Jesus is to us? Does that mean that I have set up some idols in my life that I just consider to be more important than God? Uh, And so to that end, again, uh, the end of helping us recognize uh, that our God is the greatest good, uh, that he is our greatest good, uh, and as the one one that we want to praise more than anything else, uh, Paul is going to, again, help us with a long list of blessings that God has lavished on us. Uh, Look back at verse 3 for uh, the specific reason that Paul gives for praising God. Uh, He says that God has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. I think we need a quick translation there, right? <laughs> what exactly does that mean? It means that God has not necessarily given Christians every single physical blessings. There are going to be Christians, uh, and maybe uh, this describes you very well, who lack money, who lack power, who lack fame, who lack good looks, who lack status, who lack possessions, who lack freedom. Uh, any other earthly blessing that people can have, you may not have it as a Christian. But every Christian does have every spiritual blessing in Christ. And these are blessings that stay with you, even if you do lose all those possible physical blessings. And that is an amazing thing. Paul is now uh, going to explain those spiritual blessings to us uh, in a little more detail. In verses 4 through 6, Paul writes, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. The first spiritual blessing Paul mentions here 
uh, and he is uh, actually going to continue to riff on this blessing throughout this section, is that God chose us. Again, an amazing thing. And absolutely vital too. Very often, uh, we are not going to be chosen by the world around us. We're often going to be rejected by friends and family, people that we had trusted. Uh, We are going to be rejected sometimes uh, when we do what is right. But because we know that God's approval is ours, because we know that God himself has chosen us, we can strive to do God's will. We can strive to do what is right, even when the rest of the world will hate us for it. And that's an absolutely vital thing in the world right now. Uh, Paul also says uh, that we were chosen to be God's children. He specifically says sons here. And this is a really important thing for us to grasp because back in that culture, uh, it was the sons who received the inheritance. And so in this case, what Paul is trying to get across is that we are in the family of God with full inheritance rights. We have the inheritance of God, which is eternal life. And that is ours absolutely because Jesus has died for us. Um, Now, there are two vital descriptions of how God chose us. First off, uh, Paul says that God chose us in him, that is, specifically in Jesus Christ. Jesus is absolutely vital to our relationship with God. We do not come to the Father without the Son. God chooses no one outside of Jesus. Secondly, uh, we read that God chose us in Christ before the creation of the world. Uh, Again, our relationship with God cannot come from anything you or I have done. Uh, It is not ours because we read the Bible this much or because we went to catechism class or because uh, we are relatively good people. It happened in Jesus and it happened even before we had done anything good or bad. And if God chose us that long ago, we do You and I, we do not have to worry ourselves with doubts about whether we are truly saved, whether we are sincere enough, whether we have done enough good, or or whether God can forgive those specific sins that I'm guilty of. Because God already chose us. All that is left is for us to believe this beautiful promise that God has given us. But look uh, look at what God has chosen us for. He chose us to be holy and blameless in his sight. Now that happens in two ways. First, We are holy and blameless because God has taken away all your sins. He died with them on the cross and our sins died with him. We mentioned that uh, God only chooses you and me through Jesus because without Jesus, you and I still have all our sins, right? Outside of Jesus, we still have to deal with all of our own evil. But with Jesus, God has already removed our sin. In fact, killing our sinful nature on Jesus' cross and now raising us to new life at Jesus' resurrection. That is the first way that we are holy and blameless in God's sight. We are holy in the fact that God has removed our sin. And as people without sin, we remain holy in God's sight. Uh, And the second way is that we grow uh, through Christ to hate sin and to love what is good. We start to recognize that it is good for me to love my neighbor like God commands. It is good for me uh, and for the world around me for for me to love God above all else like God wants me to. I I stop trying to convince myself that my sins are actually good and I instead uh, grow to agree with God that my sins are horrible and I I want to stop doing them. I want to live more and more in line with uh, God's will for me. That is the holiness uh, that we have in Christ then showing itself in our daily lives as we seek to praise God above all else. And notice too, uh, that God chose us in accordance with his pleasure and will. Think about that, right? It put a smile on God's face to choose you as his own. When my, uh, when my conscience is really bothering me, I, I ask why on earth God would choose somebody as worthless as myself, right? Uh, there are way better people out there whom God could have chosen. Why did he waste his choice on me? And Paul says, Don't think like that, (laughs) right? God is happy. He's pleased to choose you and me to be his own. He talked about us, uh, or we talked about uh, that you and I just naturally share good news. If God was like us like that, uh, he would be running around excitedly telling people that we are his own. He is not ashamed to call us brothers. He is not ashamed to call us his own family. Uh, Now there's more here, uh, but for the sake of time, we're gonna keep going. Uh, Paul continues in verse seven and eight. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Again, all of this uh, is in him, right? It is in Jesus. He says that we have redemption. That word means to buy back. I grew up uh, for a while in lower Michigan. Uh, when And there, whenever we bought cans of soda, 
Uh, we weren't allowed to, mom and dad wouldn't allow us to crush the cans or to recycle them on our own because there was a program in that uh, area where you had to take uh, the full cans, uh, full-sized cans and everything, uh, you had to take them back to the store and put them in these machines and the store would buy back those cans. Uh, that was kind of their uh, program for making sure that cans got recycled. Uh, in the same way, uh, you and I have been paid for in full. We have been bought back. Jesus purchased us, uh, however, Jesus purchased us, not with a few bucks like those cans. He bought us with his holy, precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. That is how great a price God was willing to pay for you. You can never uh, really know how much somebody loves you until you see how great a cost they are willing to pay for your good. God was willing to give up everything to do you and me good. That is real love. Let's pause there for a moment. Uh, Paul says that God showed us this grace, that he lavished it on us with all wisdom and understanding. Many uh, people will point to the story of Romeo and Juliet as an example of true love. Uh, in the story, Romeo and Juliet uh, fall madly in love with each other, uh, but then through a tragic set of circumstances, uh, they both end up taking their lives rather than live without the other. Now, they, uh, they were certainly... Uh, willing to pay a great cost for each other. Again, by that previous definition uh, of love that we just gave, uh, they certainly did love each other a lot. But when you look at the rest of the story, you kind of get the idea that these were also just immature children that really didn't know the first thing about what it actually means to love someone else. There's a clear ignorance uh, that you often see in young love uh, where, where people can become more in love with their idealized version of the person, or, or they're maybe just even in love with the idea of love itself, than they are actually having any kind of love for the actual person uh, that, that is in front of them. And this is where you sometimes see couples uh, fall madly in love with each other for a while, but then uh, slowly time passes and the uh, enamoration kind of fall, kind of wears off a little bit. And uh, you, they suddenly start to notice the, all the warts and all the imperfections. Uh, and now, yeah, they're not quite as enamored as they once were, right? Um, God does not love you that way, right? He wasn't, he, he's not fooled by you because he had a, a really good time on the first date. Right? Uh, he doesn't love you because uh, he's only seen you at your best or because uh, you had some, he has some perfect vision of you in his mind uh, that really doesn't actually match the real you, but he's going to cling on to this, this vision that he has. No, God lavished his love on, uh, on you and me with all wisdom and understanding. He knows you at your worst. He's seen you at your deepest failures. He's seen you at your deepest struggles, your greatest imperfections and ugliness. But, still pleases him to choose you as his own, to give up everything so that you might be his forever. That is true love with all wisdom and understanding. Paul then uh, says in verses 9 to 10, And he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. Here Paul mentions this mystery of God's will. Uh, in this context, a mystery is something that we could not have known unless it was revealed to us, unless God himself revealed it to us. I, I uh, am always a big fan of uh, a good mystery. You know, it's, it's so fascinating when a, a story can expertly uh, bring together all of these seemingly unconnected points uh, into some kind of amazing revelation. Uh, in the world around us, we are living in the greatest mystery of all. What is happening in the world, right? Uh, where is this all going, right? What is God's will in all of this? What is he doing through all the events of history and, and current day affairs? We get that mystery revealed as we open up the scriptures and read God's word to us. God lets us in on the secret. How cool is that? Notice how Paul describes that mystery revealed here briefly. Uh, it's, it's broadened out uh, quite a lot in other scriptures. Uh, but here, Paul says that the, the times or the ages are heading toward a fulfillment. What he says is uh, that all things be brought under Christ as their head. All the various things going on in our lives and in the world all around us are aimed at Christ's final inauguration as king of all when he comes again at the end of the world. But you and I have the benefit of being ahead of the curve here, 
right? Uh, we have the benefit of coming under the rule of Jesus Christ long before that happens. And as we read the scriptures, the Holy Spirit works on our hearts so that we do love God's will and live according to it. And in that, God brings us into the royal reign of Christ. A lot of people talk about whether or not uh, so-and-so is on the right side of history. As Christians, we know we are eternally on the right side of history because history ends with Jesus as king overall. Paul continues in verses uh, 11 through 12. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. Paul mentioned this before, uh, but here we have a really good opportunity to talk about predestination. Uh, this is one of those horribly difficult uh, teachings of the scriptures uh, that'll really make your head spin if you really want if you really want every single one of your questions to be answered. Uh, and the problem is that the Holy Spirit uh, just doesn't care to answer every single question you and I have. <laughs> uh, so we simply have to work with what the Holy Spirit does uh, decide that we should know. Um, and so regarding predestination, the Bible never lays it out uh, specifically that before creation, God picked out some people to go to heaven and other people to go to hell. Uh, instead, predestination is always uh, talked about as God uh, talking to believers to point out just how certain you can be in your salvation. Uh, this, this goes back to, to what we said about uh, how God chose you, right? Uh, he looked forward and marked you out to be his own even with a perfect understanding of all your faults, weaknesses, and sins. And he chose you to be his family. He chose to die for you. That is a promise for you to believe, just like every other gospel promise. And so we believe. And when we believe, those, uh, when we, believe we do receive those benefits. But if we do not believe, uh, if we reject those promises, then, well, we reject, uh, we reject those blessings that God wants us to have. Again, it does not answer every single one of our questions. It even bristles against our logic and reason quite a bit, right? However, it still remains this beautiful promise uh, that we can cling to and then praise God for. And that's uh, one more blessing here that Paul mentions uh, for us. Paul says that God works out everything according to his will so that those who hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. Remember what we said about the purpose of our lives. Uh, Paul has no delusions of grandeur and he is not offering us any. Uh, instead, Christians... Uh, are not to puff ourselves up and be filled with our own self-importance. Uh, rather, we are to listen and learn humbly uh, to chase God's glory. We aim at bringing him praise rather than ourselves. Finally, uh, the last words we'll look at from Paul today, verses 13 and 14. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Paul again gives us this uh, promise from God that we too have been included in Christ. And that happens when we hear the gospel promises and believe them. Paul is again riffing on this uh, scriptural concept that when you hear the words of scripture, the Holy Spirit is then working on your heart. And when we believe, that is the Holy Spirit's miracle to bring salv or this saving faith into our hearts. Uh, the fact that you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior is a miracle, the scriptures say. It is proof uh, that all of these amazing blessings from God through Jesus are yours. You look back on your life. Have you been baptized? Do you receive the Lord's Supper? Do you believe that Jesus died for you and rose again? Then you have the Holy Spirit living in you as a down payment which guarantees that all of these amazing gifts from God are ours now, spiritually, and they will fully be ours in the life to come. Again, how awesome is that? And once again, like Paul says, uh, he gives us this reminder that this is all for the praise of God. It is all for his glory, not for ours. Uh, it is not to, to make us, us foolishly prideful. Uh, it is not for us to look down on everybody who's not as good as we are. Uh, instead, it keeps us aimed rightly in life, that we receive these wonderful gifts and that we might eternally be aimed uh, at the greatest of goods, praising our God. I pray that our time together uh, helped you uh, to recognize the amazing blessings that God has for you and the good news now that you can share with anyone else. Amen. And I say, I say, I say, it can't be that easy. And he said, he said, and no, it wasn't easy. But be still and know that I am God. Be still.